Nearly every Avenger spilled blood in the battle of Earth. In the aftermath, some were sent in to collect that DNA, which is probably where he got the idea for the Super Scroll machine. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Marvel Secret Invasion Episode 5 video. There are a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references, a couple of cameo scenes, too, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. There's only one episode left, too. Episode 6, the finale, will be next week. Careful for spoilers from the episode if you haven't seen it yet. We'll just start at the beginning and work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs and WTF moments, starting with the title, Harvest, which is a reference to the Avengers DNA samples that Gravik thinks Nick Fury has, hoping to use them to give all the Super Scrolls copies of all the most powerful Avengers abilities, making them nearly invincible, claiming that they harvested a bunch of the Avengers DNA from the final battle in Avengers Endgame. We'll see if that isn't a misdirect, like Nick Fury claims that he has the harvest and he got it, but it might wind up being a misdirect just to get close to Gravik. Why would Nick Fury keep something that dangerous lying around? My early theory is that he probably destroyed all the samples after he had all the scrolls collect them in the aftermath of the Battle of Avengers Endgame. Suddenly all the Iron Man truthers are like, we have his DNA, let's clone Iron Man, let's bring him back that way. The actual opening scene basically picks up in the moments right after the end of last week's episode with him taking the president to the hospital while trying to tell him that Rhodey really is a scroll, hoping that the president can still hear him like he's on the edge of death, posting up in front of the operating room. When you rewatch the episode now, you kind of wonder when scroll Rhodey or Scrody, however you want to think about him, when he's talking to the president, trying to get him to attack Russia, don't you wonder now if the president really knows that he's a scroll or believes that he's a scroll and is just leading Rhodey along until he actually does something to try and get rid of him? It's kind of like knowing that Rhodey has been a scroll for a while and going back and watching the old Marvel movies in new context. Like, watch his old scenes in those previous Marvel movies, wondering if he's a scroll in this moment. You notice on the news broadcast, they're talking about the attack with Talos as if it's a huge revelation. The world had no idea that the Skrulls existed before this, calling him a shape-shifting alien. There have been a couple reveals during the series where you kind of wonder, like, wait a minute, they're just finding out about this now? Like, wouldn't some of the other Avengers characters have known some of these secrets before now? My assumption when it comes to stuff like that, like who knew what and when did they know it, is that Black Widow, for instance, probably knew more than some of the other Avengers, but a lot of the Avengers probably knew the truth about the Skrulls. Like, Iron Man probably would have figured out about the scrolls with all the stuff he was doing around the world, like his access to information just in general, all of his technology. When Gravik starts yelling at Pagon, his second-in-command, about not stealing what he was supposed to, he's talking about Cole Obsidian's severed hand from Avengers Infinity War. They'll probably finally obtain it in the finale and use that to give themselves enhanced strength and durability, basically giving them Hulk-like powers. And if we're making Fantastic Four references, because that's basically what they're doing in the series, using all these other abilities as references to the original Super Scrolls powers in the comics, which were based on the Fantastic Four's powers. Cole Obsidian would be the reference to the thing, Ben Grimm's powers. It's clobbering time. They make it seem like Gravik hasn't killed Nick Fury yet because he's the only person on the planet who knows where the Avengers harvested DNA is stored, the harvest itself, and that would make them nearly invincible. Not just Thor's DNA, for instance, but like Spider-Man powers, Captain Marvel's powers, Scarlet Witch's powers, real Hulk Gamma powers. If we're talking about powers, the Hulk would be way stronger than the thing. And the funny thing about this is already a storyline in the MCU with Hulk and She-Hulk's DNA that they'll pay off in Captain America 4 when Thunderbolt Ross becomes President of the United States replacing President Ritson in this series. Still got to answer the question about why that winds up happening. It also winds up using the leader who's coming back in the movie from the Incredible Hulk film to give him Red Hulk powers. Then he orders Skrull Rhodey to blame the attack on the Russians, but also making it seem like the Skrulls are helping them, trying to get the president to attack Russia and start World War III, thinking that if they don't, the Skrulls will help the Russians take over the rest of the planet. One of the other big reveals during this scene, too, is that Skrull Rhodey's real name is actually Rava, which reminds me of Legend of Korra in Avatar The Last Airbender with Rava and Vatu. Maybe there's a Skrull out there somewhere who's also named Vatu, giving themselves Super Skrull abilities to bend the four elements. Fire, wind, water, and earth. We actually just got a trailer for the new Netflix live-action Avatar The Last Airbender series, so I'll post a link in the description below. And I'll do new videos for the new Avatar The Last Airbender animated episodes and animated movies when they start releasing those two in the next couple of years. 
But Gravik's whole plan here is to get Nick Fury to capitulate to help them or to stop trying to prevent them from taking over the planet because of all the collateral damage that will wind up happening and the idea that a lot of the other humans that they have stored at that Russian base will also wind up dying. And they're all world leaders, really important people. So not only does Nick Fury want to save all the real people and bring them back too, he also wants to save the good scrolls. That's what Gravik was talking about when he said we need to prepare for the sacrifice, quote unquote, the collateral damage and all the dead scrolls that'll wind up being killed when the U.S. attacks Russia. Also the idea that if they really do successfully set off World War III and the Avengers really do assemble again, it will cause the destruction of most of their race. And the thing about this is that as bad as he seems so far, even Skrull Rhodey seems like he has his doubts about the plan, like Gravik's own people are starting to turn against him slowly. Nick Fury then confronts Scrody, trying to out him, which he can't do without killing him, and reveals that they've released the footage of Gravik killing Maria Hill to all the news outlets around the world, turning Nick Fury into enemy number one. Suddenly he knows what it's like to be Spider-Man with the entire world coming for your blood. And now J. Jonah Jameson has something to yell about besides Spider-Man, but I am sure, I am positive that he will find some way to blame Maria Hill's death on Spider-Man, even though the footage clearly shows it being Nick Fury. One of J. Jonah Jameson's superpowers is the ability to blame any situation on Spider-Man, no matter what happened or who was involved. Then we get another cameo scene from Tony Curran, who you probably recognize from a couple other Marvel movies. He's been in a bunch of other stuff, too. He's one of Sonya Fallsworth's MI6 directors during the series. They're calling him Director Weatherby in the credits. This is now the third Marvel character that he's played, making it a record, I think. There have been lots of people who have played two different Marvel characters, like Chris Evans was in Fantastic Four, and then he was Captain America. There are a lot of people that have done that. But I don't think a lot of people have played three characters yet. Before this, he was Finn Cooley during the Daredevil Netflix episodes, just a regular human mobster. And before that, he was Bor in Thor The Dark World. Bor was Odin's father and was King of Asgard before him in the MCU. The backstory of the Asgardians is a little bit different in the comics. The Thor characters have more of a Game of thrones -y backstory that gets way more complicated, and Odin was technically the founder of Asgard in the comics. But like the comic book version of Odin is over a million years old, and the one in the MCU only lived to about 5,000 years. They had a couple of jokes about these differences between MCU and comic book continuity in Thor Ragnarok when he was talking to sort of like, didn't my father almost kill you a million years ago or something? That was a reference to the comic book backstory of all the characters. Sonya Fallsworth mows over him to get the information on where the two doctors that created the Super Scroll device are so she can find it. Then Beto and the rest of Gravik's team try to pull a coup because they don't want the collateral damage that they think this will all cause and they think the Gravik's gone crazy. But because we have seen trailer footage of Gravik much later after this, we know that he was going to win this fight. I think the whole idea here is they want to separate Gravik from his support system, like his inner circle, the same way that Nick Fury hasn't had the Avengers helping him out the last several episodes. Like it's meant to be a parallel. There are very few people that are helping them out. But for instance, Gravik still has Skrull Rhodey. Nick Fury meets Amelia Clark's Gaia at that same hideout that they used back in 1997 to the flashback. If you couldn't tell, that's why she says she used to play underneath this mural without understanding what it meant at the time. Nick Fury makes a bunch of references to immigrants from World War II because the scrolls are basically intergalactic immigrants, saying that he chose this site because back in World War II, this place was a haven for immigrants from the West Indies. Then when he starts speechifying to her about the path of struggle, it totally gave me Pulp Fiction vibes, like Samuel L. Jackson just going on and on, really great speeches. The path of the righteous man is beset on all sides by the inequities of the selfish and the tyranny of evil men. There were a couple good speeches during this episode. Like, even though I do have some criticisms of the way they plotted out this more TV version of Secret Invasion, like it hasn't been Avengers level, he has had a couple good speeches. She agrees to help protect Vara from Gravik's men who will give her a special burial for Talos per the customs of the scrolls. I'll explain that in a second too because later in the episode there are a lot of references to the way she was raised and how she's forgotten a lot of the customs of the scrolls. She also winds up raking Nick Fury over the coals a little bit over her father's death and he tries to get her to see that his death wasn't in vain and give her the same kind of call to action that he gave to all the Avengers characters during phase one, phase two, phase three. Like he's given a lot of inspirational Avengers speeches. Her reference to putting on a good face is just another joke about the scrolls shape-shifting abilities. Sonya Fallsworth then interrogates Gravik's doctors about the Super Scroll device and kills the male doctor. She doesn't care about either of them, but she still needs one of them for more information, thus she had no problem in killing one of them. 
Olivia Colman says she's been playing the character, kind of like a British version of Val, but within the context of the MCU, she's meant to be the daughter of the original Union Jack, so she's kind of taken the mantle like Union Jack 2. But the way she's coming off is sort of like a British version of Val, like a sinister Mary Poppins. Unlike Val, though, Sonya Fallsworth isn't meant to be quite as bad, like quite as sinister of a bent, but she's not too far off. She just happens to be working with Nick Fury like they've been allies in the past. But it's not like she has special allegiance to him. If the world actually broke out in World War III, she would serve her government. She would serve the British government over Nick Fury. Then I think this whole scene with Gaia over her father, Talos's body, is just meant to confirm that he's dead. Like comic book logic, standard comic book rules, unless you see a body, they're not dead. And they spend a lot of time in this episode with her just staring at his lifeless body. And then they burn the body later. When she enters Nick Fury's house and passes all the Greek looking masks on the wall, I also like the idea that the masks themselves are references to all the different faces that the scrolls wear, like the idea that they can change their faces. When we go back to Squirrel Rhodey trying to get the president to attack Gravik's base, like I said, I think the idea here is the president might already suspect that Rhodey is a scroll. Like maybe he did hear what Nick Fury told him. One of the funny things, though, because we don't get any more scenes with him in this episode, is that people in real life asked the actor if he knew how the series was going to end and what was going to happen to him that would lead to Thunderbolt Ross becoming president in Captain America 4. And he was like, wait a minute, that does not bode well for my character. What happens to me? Because Marvel apparently didn't give him the pages for the end of Secret Invasion. They just gave him the pages for the scenes that he was in meaning that he is not in the very final scenes of the episode, which makes sense. Like, there's probably some post credit scenes that set up the Marvel's movie and the other upcoming Marvel movies. Gravik and Nick Fury trade barbs, telling him to bring the Avengers DNA samples or it's all going to go down. And then they have a surprise cameo from O.T. Fag Benley, who comes back as Mason from the Black Widow movie, if you didn't remember. He's just a mercenary within the context of the MCU who's worked with Natasha Black Widow, Yelena Belova. Pretty much all of the others, like Nick Fury, just getting them weapons, planes, tech, anything that they needed. Kind of a less sinister version of Sharon Carter's power broker character, doing the same type of stuff. Fun fact too, super deep cut, in the Black Widow movie, he was originally secretly going to be Taskmaster. They hired him with the intention that that's the character that he was playing. Like he would pretend to be Mason, then really wind up being Taskmaster. They filmed a bunch of scenes with this intent, like if you remember all the theories that came out when the first couple of trailers dropped, like look how tall this person is, this person is huge compared to Natasha Black Widow, it's gotta be a man underneath that costume. That's because the stunt double that was wearing the costume was a man and it was meant to be his stunt double. But at some point when they were filming the Black Widow movie, like after a while, they just decided to pivot on the idea and make the Taskmaster Drakoff's daughter. She'll come back during the Thunderbolts movie when Val puts that team together. They make a joke about the Avengers helicarrier being mothballed, another reference to them not being able to use the Avengers characters during the Secret Invasion series. Like, haha, remember when we had all that cool Avengers stuff? Yeah, no, we can't use that right now. Then they have Talos' special scroll burial ceremony. Vara helps Gaia perform traditional scroll burial rites. They also use this scene to show you more of scroll culture, just in general. This ring belonged to Talos' wife, Gaia's mother. And I think the whole concept of Gaia not knowing how to perform a traditional scroll burial ceremony or the prayer that they're supposed to say is meant to be a reference to like the phenomenon in real life where children of immigrants who grew up completely in another country, another culture, don't remember or never fully learn the traditions of the original culture that they came from. That happens all the time in real life. So like the idea is that Gaia has been living amongst humans for so long, she's forgotten what it's like to live as a scroll or live on scrollos. So the prayer just in general sounds like it's kind of like the same burial rites the Asgardians perform, like the scrolls have their own version of the afterlife and they're ushering Talos into the scroll afterlife. We learned a little bit about the way this works during the Moon Knight series, like the afterlife in general is just an alternate dimension that people's consciousness goes to when their physical bodies die. The dimension that you go to is just based on your own belief system, or if you have a contract with a higher cosmic entity or a god, you go to the afterlife associated with that god. Really good example is that Moon Knight didn't worship the Egyptian gods or believe in Egyptian afterlife like the Duat before he died, but because of his contract with Khonshu, that's where he went after he died. During the episode, they just call it the beyond. Vara also references her seeing Talos again eventually. She's talking about seeing him in the afterlife after she dies someday. There's no hinting that he'll come back to life, even though that is possible, like you can come back to life as we saw during Moon Knight, but in order to do it, your physical body still needs to be intact and they just cremated Talos' body. So there is no coming back for him. 
She also jokes about her last words to Nick Fury before he got snapped in Avengers Infinity War, saying that she might leave him if he kept spending so much time away from their marriage out on missions. And she reveals the real reason why she's been sticking around at their house waiting for graphics men to come kill her is because it's incredibly defensible. You have to remember, we're talking about Nick Fury and his wife here. They have contingency plans upon contingency plans. She has weapons stashed all over the house, as you would expect in Nick Fury's house. They also remind you that she used to be an Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., even though S.H.I.E.L.D. itself, most people inside S.H.I.E.L.D. didn't know that she was secretly a scroll. So, like, she has the same combat training that any of the other Avengers, like even Black Widow, would have. And even though she appears to be very old, scrolls live extremely long lives, so technically she's still pretty young for a scroll. It's just that the form that she's wearing right now is of an older woman. She also reveals that she bought the house 15 years ago, putting it in 2011 because present day of the MCU is meant to be 2026 when this is happening, meaning that Nick Fury and her probably bought the house after the events of the first Thor movie. But part of her joke is that she is the person who actually found the house and bought it, hoping that Nick Fury would settle down with her there and stop running around the world. But he didn't, obviously, because the first three phases of Marvel were pretty busy, like the Infinity Saga movies kept him pretty busy. Gaia also makes a sly Nick Fury masochist joke saying that he loves places with lots of leather, which is also meant to be foreshadowing for the end of the episode where he gets his leather jacket and his eye patch back. The argument that they get into though over whether or not she spent time in her own scroll natural skin around Nick Fury is meant to be about compromise and I think foreshadowing for the way that they end the series and what happens with the rest of the scrolls that are left over. I think what they're trying to set up here is the idea that all the rest of the scrolls will get to stay on Earth, but the compromise for them is that they'll have to blend in more with the rest of the humans. So yes, they can revert to their natural scroll form a little bit more, but for the most part, they still have to walk around in human looking skin. Some of you will also remember too that his wife during this series also played his mother during the Unbreakable movies. So it's a little bit of a funny association there just going back and watching those movies now. They have a pretty solid action scene. It's over pretty quickly, but they defend the house. And as you would expect, she has weapons stashed all over the place. The only thing I was disappointed by is that Emilia Clarke's Gaia character didn't use her extremist fire based powers yet. She's only used the healing power so far. Hopefully she'll use the fire abilities before the series is over. We get another Captain America Winter Soldier reference, and you could probably call it a Mission Impossible reference too, because the new Mission Impossible movie just came out and there's a lot of face switching in that movie. Nick Fury enters Finland wearing a special mask. It's the same mask technology that they use in Captain America Winter Soldier to pretend to be someone else to get past customs. They call it the Widow's Veil because it's based on Black Widow technology that Natasha probably helped them develop. They also wind up revealing that Sonya Fallsworth did not know Rhodey was a Skrull and his wife was a Skrull as well. He also explains the details behind the actual harvesting of the Avengers DNA and why it wound up happening in the first place. The idea is that during the final battle in Avengers Endgame, all the Avengers, even Carol Danvers, spilled blood, leaving their DNA samples all over the ground, all over the place. So when Val, Thunderbolt Ross, other interested sinister people went in to collect samples, Nick Fury also sent in his scroll agents, pretending to be humans, to get the samples before them. And I think part of the idea was he did that to prevent the samples of the Avengers DNA from getting into the hands of terrible people. But the consequence of that is that Gravik, who was on that team of scrolls working for Nick Fury, learned about the Avengers DNA and that gave him the idea to create super scrolls. Blame it all on Thanos in that final battle in Avengers Endgame. But that's meant to be the major reason why Nick Fury feels responsible for the entirety of Secret Invasion. He's at least partially responsible for breaking his promise to find them a new planet to live on. Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel, also kind of responsible for that too. And for giving Gravik the whole idea to create super scrolls. He also makes it sound like if this hadn't happened, like if Secret Invasion and Gravik's plan hadn't started, he would still be on that Saber space station. He would never would have come to Earth in the first place. Then he explains why his grave here is in Finland is because he and his wife Vara had their honeymoon here because scrolls like the cold, also revealing to Sonya Fallsworth that his wife is a scroll. And it's meant to be him trying to explain to Sonya Fallsworth that some of the scrolls are good people because her whole thing in the past couple of episodes has been trying to find a reason to kill all scrolls. That's what Talos was worried about at the beginning of the series. Like, if we don't stop her, she'll kill all the scrolls on the planet. Then he also jokes that he has gravestones like this all over the planet because a man needs options. So he has secret weapons, stashes, supplies all over the world, as you would expect. I mean, we're talking about Nick Fury here. Nick Fury also winds up referencing his mother and his wife. Also, the fact that he grew up without a father, like a little bit more of Nick Fury's backstory. They've been using the series to tell you a bunch about his backstory. 
They make another Avengers reference with her asking why he hasn't called the Avengers to help him like your special friends. The real reason, obviously, is budget. Reportedly, the series cost them over $200 million to make. That doesn't feel like a $200 million series, but I think part of the reason for that is inflation caused by the pandemic and some of the special protocols in filming TV series and movies right now. Kevin Feige said when they started making the Marvel Disney Plus series, they wanted to keep the budget closer to like $150 million. This is also part of the reason why Marvel is stretching out the releases so much. Like when they said that they're not doing as many Disney Plus series for Marvel or Star Wars stuff, what they meant is that they're just doing them less frequently mostly because they're super expensive. There's still a bunch of stuff coming later this year. Like we have Loki season two episodes. We have the X-Men episodes that'll start at the beginning of next year. Don't worry, I'll do videos for all that stuff when we get new trailers for everything. When it grabs the vial of Avengers DNA though, like I said earlier, don't you think this is meant to be a misdirect and there's no actual Avengers DNA in there? Like why would he actually have Avengers DNA that he would take to that Russian base if it weren't a big fake out? The other thing here too, talking more about Marvel Phase 7 and beyond with X-Men characters, Sonya Fallsworth talks about Darwin, she's talking about Charles Darwin in the concept of evolution. You could also call this a reference to the concept of mutants in X-Men and the MCU Homo Superior, the next evolution of humanity already having started, like Kamala Khan was born a mutant in the MCU. Pretty soon we'll start seeing way more mutants showing up in the MCU. That's probably what they'll use the next big saga of Marvel movies for. Like we're in the middle of the multiverse saga after Avengers 6 Secret Wars when we start Marvel Phase 7. They'll probably have the mutant saga. Everybody hearing them play the theme song in their head. He gets his trademark leather jacket and eye patch back looking more like the OG Nick Fury. This is just meant to be like the Avengers level Nick Fury coming back. Like all right shit's on. And it winds up being one of the shortest episodes of the series so far. Like it's pretty quick. There are a couple major hanging plot threads they have to resolve in the finale next week. What happens to Gravik? Like, does Nick Fury wind up killing him? Because it does seem like he gets way more Super Scroll powers. What happens to the rest of the scrolls? I already talked about that. I think it'll be a compromise, quote unquote, and they'll continue getting to live on Earth. What happens to President Ritson that leads Thunderbolt Ross becoming U.S. President by the events of Captain America 4? And how do they end things in a way that set up the Marvel's movie like a post credit scene with Captain Marvel cameo scene or a Monica Rambeau cameo scene with him going back to the Sabre space station? Generally, there's still a ton of stuff that they have to wrap up. Let me know in the comments what kind of a post credit scene you're expecting, though. If you did spot any Easter eggs or references in the episode that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments. My episode 6 finale trailer video will post on Thursday and my full episode 6 video will post next week after they release it. Remember too, this weekend is Comic-Con. We're probably going to get a couple Comic-Con trailers. Like I think we'll get a new Marvel's trailer pretty soon, a new Invincible Season 2 trailer, maybe some Loki Season 2 footage pretty soon. Whatever they wind up releasing, even though there's not a big Marvel Hall H panel, I'll do videos for it. Don't worry. Click here for that Secret Invasion Episode 6 finale video. I'll update the link as soon as I post that and click here for my new Deadpool 3 video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.